Amen. 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 Good midday to you guys. We praise God that everybody was able to make it and that you got here free from harm. We thank God that God brought you here in safe traveling and that your mind thus far is on Jesus. And if it's anywhere else, you're in the wrong place. Uh, that's room 101. That's two doors down to the left. The gospel is in this room here. And, uh, we just want you to know that. So you can be focused and you can get right. Our gospel meeting this week has been designed solely for you and for this great city that we're in. Um, we have a minister, an evangelist that's come up from Washington, D.C. And the only thing he's going to have on his mind for the next four days is to deliver the truth to you. Please, at the end of uh, each one of our lessons, have your questions. Be ready. So you can get a biblical answer. There are so many. I, I checked uh, Friday. There's about 2,000 now. 2,000 registered religions. And I'm not counting Judaism. I'm not counting devil worshipers. And I'm not counting Muslims. There's 2,000 registered Christian religions. Now, if there is one faith, one Lord, and one baptism, and one God, somebody got to be wrong. Amen. So we want to establish that this week. Now, we did not design this this week to talk about anybody and to make anybody look bad. What we have designed this to do is for you to open the Bible and to see the truth that is going to be proclaimed to you. Now, if you have an issue with Genesis, the Revelation, you're going to have an issue with the gospel meeting. Because the gospel meeting is truth. And that's what we're trying to do in this city. Because so many people are saying so many things. And I think we need to establish what truth is. Because truth is going to be one of the books that's going to be open when we stand in judgment day. Okay, so we just want to do that. Brother Freeman is a native of uh, Detroit, Michigan. He's a veteran gospel preacher. Having labored in the ministry for 37 years. He received his formal training from the... Cameroon Avenue School of Preaching in Detroit, Michigan, under the instruction of the late Alex Davenport. He majored in art in high school and at the University of Detroit and Mary Grove College in Michigan. He has taught art fundamentals at the Normandy Christian School in Los Angeles, California. He holds a BBA and an MBA in organizational psychology, having graduated summa cum laude from the AIU American Intercontinental University. He serves as the Associate Minister at the Church of Christ in Cameron Avenue in Detroit, Michigan for five years. He served at the, as Minister of the Church of Christ in Ridgewood, uh, Toledo, Ohio for five years. He served as the Minister of the Church of Christ Westside in Santa Ana, California for 18 years. And as the Minister of the Church of Christ Cypress of Cypress, California, having facilitated a merger between the Westside Congregation and the Cypress Congregation. He uh, currently labors as the minister of the Church of Christ, 13th Street, over Washington, D.C. He has proclaimed the gospel on the weekly television broadcast, The Bible is Right, which was aired throughout Southern Orange County in California, as well as contributed to a weekly featured article in the Los Angeles Times, Orange County Edition, religion section entitled Questions of Faith. He is a mentor and a community leader for the Court Services of Offenders Supervision Agency, which is a federal agency providing supervision of all adults on probation, parole, and supervised release in the District of Columbia. He has conducted gospel meetings, revivals, lectureships, workshops, forums, and the like in some 39 states as well as Nassau, Bahamas. He is, the author, he is an author, a graphic designer, and an accomplished artist. He is married to Christine, has two children, a son Matthew, and a daughter, Dallas. Please turn with me to 1 Samuel, chapter 16, 1 through 13. That will be our scriptural reading. Our sermon uh, this midday is, You Must Know About Me. And that's going to be taken from 1 Samuel, chapter 16, and the first 13 verses. If you do not have a Bible, elbow somebody so you can get one. It is imperative that you read along with this so as he's preaching this to you, you can see it in the Bible. Please do not sit here without your Bible open or your electronic device turned to the scriptures so you can see the word of God as true. Please, we will stress that every single time we meet so you'll know that we're not reading out of any other source but the gospel itself. Verse 13 verses, and it reads thusly, Now the Lord said to Samuel, 
How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he says, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Elab and said, Surely the Lord anointed, anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical nature and stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came down, they came upon David from the day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Brother Freeman will now do the rest. Brother Freeman. In eager anticipation. We have awaited this day. You all have prayed and planned and planned and prayed. And God has brought us to this hour collectively, individually. And we're striving now to adjust our heart and our mind to the very workings of the Father so that we can ultimately then surrender our will to His will. To say like Christ so many centuries ago, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Mm -hmm. And truly, if this word that is higher than the disposition and the position of every son and daughter upon this earth, we can find ourselves then truly being the recipients of the grace of God, the goodness of God, the power of God. We members of the churches of Christ across the length and breadth of this land, believe in the validity of the Bible, mm -hmm. the accuracy of the Bible, the authority of the Bible. Believe and maintain that the Bible is God's main method for directing man and teaching man. Yes, we can look up into the heavens above and recognize the hand of the Almighty. We would concede the fact. Scientists concede the fact. The learned Men concede the fact. Theologians indeed concede the fact. The learned and the educated concede the fact that back behind of design, there must be a design. Mm -hmm. uh, back behind that which is created, there must be a creator. Mm -hmm. and, and wisdom dictates that that thing that has been created must have had some form of higher intelligence to create it. Mm -hmm. That is to suggest the, the watch that I wear. It could not conceivably have come into existence by mere happenstance. Oh, All of its components, 
as intricate as they are, the way that it is manufactured and the way that it works, its reliability and its accuracy, it could not have just simply come into being. That's right. It had to have been created mm -hmm. and manufactured. Right. It had to have been established and wisdom dictates that back behind this design, whoever manufactured it had to be smarter than it. Yeah. You might as well say amen right there. Yeah. That is to suggest a monkey could not have reasonably been accounted for designing the watch. Right. It, it had to take a higher form of intelligence. I, I could not conceivably take all of the components and put them in a box, shake the box up and think that I'm going to get this conclusion. Mm -hmm. no, no, there, there had to be someone wise enough to put the components together so that they can work properly. How then can some come to the conclusion that the intricacies of this world Bible plan, a man himself could possibly been the result of some random thought and some attribute of a divine accident, or not even divine accident, just a, a great big bang. Mm -hmm. And now, here we are in all of our complexity, right. all of our simplicity. No, brothers and sisters and visiting friends, back behind design is a designer. Back behind creation is a creator. Yes. That creator, according to the pages of divine inspiration, is none more and none less than God the Father. Amen. God, by and through his infinite wisdom, yeah. has designed all things after the counsel of his own good will yes. and its own purpose. We members of the Church of Christ believe in the accuracy of the Bible. Say it with me then this morning. The Bible is right. The Bible is right. Friends, it will always be right. It is the mind of God that has been revealed to mankind. Brother Stanley stood before us now and he read those verses that we're going to be examining thoroughly, prayerfully uh, this Lord's Day morning. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13 as we extrapolate from those verses the message and the thoughts that are upon my heart and upon my mind, and we're trusting and praying that you read through your Bible as well. We're going to be making constant references back to that illustrative story, and we're striving to make application of that word to our lives. We want to use 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 13, and we want to combine that with another passage of Scripture extracted from the New Testament of the Word of God, Acts chapter 13. And verse 22, Acts, the 13th chapter, yes. and verse 22, say amen when you're there. Right. Acts, the 13th chapter, and verse 22, there the Bible says, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. This morning and every morning, God wants every individual to become a person after his own heart. Some 3,000 years ago, God made choice by his divine wisdom. He made choice of a young man named David mm -hmm. to be and to become the king of Israel. Out of all the sons of Jesse, and the divine favor of God landed upon a lad who was a simple shepherd boy. David, the youngest son of a poor farmer, from the tiny hamlet of Bethlehem. David, a young man who was not even respected by the members of his own family. David, a young nobody, living in a family of supposed somebodies. Mm -hmm. Yet, 
By the grace of God, David became the greatest king in the history of the nation of Israel. All right. He became one of the ancestors of the Lord Jesus Christ, right. listed amongst the heroes of fame in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. During his lifetime, he received great promises and remarkable blessings from the hand of God. But I would suggest to you that greatest of all of these achievements and greatest of all these accoutrements of his life, he became known as a man after God's own heart. Right. This was not David's testimony. This was not his fellow man's testimony. This is what God said. Mm -hmm. God said, I found David to be a man after my own heart. Man, that's some kind of testimony. All right. To have God the Father give that as a recommendation. Now, let's let, let not fool ourselves. David was by no means perfect. Yeah. In fact, he was far from perfect. Mm -hmm. Have you read the story about David? Yeah. Do you know some of the things that David did? Yeah. Do you not know that David failed and he failed big time? Yeah. He, he sinned and sinned grievously before God. But you see, he kept short accounts with God. God had him on a short leash when he sinned and when his sins were confronted when he was made to face his sins he confessed repented of that thing and we know it was genuine repentance because David never repeated that thing he never made that mistake again ever in his life I read about it David seen it but he didn't commit that particular sin again so David has so much that he can instruct us so much that he can <coughs> teach us about obedience. Mm -hmm. Teach us about faith. Teach us about what it is to worship God. Teach us about who it indeed is telling us the truth. And then being able to recognize that truth. So as the Lord leads us just this moment, let's look together at David. And let's give some consideration to a subject suggested from the text that we read. God had rejected Saul from being king mm -hmm. and decided he was going to choose another man. Mm -hmm. he, he made choice of a man who was very unlikely to be selected. But God in his wisdom called his servant by the name of Samuel to go down to the Bethlehem and find a young man whom he was going to select. He gave Samuel limited information. He gave Samuel just enough information to send him on his way. Mm -hmm. And Samuel had to act in faith based upon the revelation that God was given. Follow me now. Because he only told Samuel so much. Rise, fill your horn with oil. Go down to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse. And there I will tell you what else you're going to do. Uh, Samuel said to the Lord, how can I go to anoint another king? Saul is going to hear about it. He's going to rise up and kill him. You know the way Saul is. He ain't got no sense. Mm -hmm. God says, uh, take a heifer with you. Take a bullock with you. Take a cow with you. Go down and make a sacrifice. And in doing the sacrifice, I'll tell you what else it is that you're going to do. Samuel makes his way down and, and the people are afraid. They're, they're afraid of Samuel because Samuel had just laid waste to Agag. He had just uh, killed Agag under the divine directions of God. God is choosing a new king. And God wants Samuel to know. God wants 
Saul to know. God wants everyone to know. You must not know about me. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. You must not know about me. I want to show you something about how God chooses and the method by which God chooses. I deluded to just now. This, this chapter, it opens up, it begins by God reminding Samuel of the fact that he's rejected Saul yes. from being king. Samuel is broken hearted. He's been yes. crying all night long. God comes to him and said, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? Yes. Seeing that I rejected him from leading my people. Yes, we, he was chosen. Yes, he became the first king of the people of Israel. And the Israel wanted a king because they wanted to be like all the other nations that were around them. And Samuel was broken hearted about that. Samuel cried before God concerning that. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, God had to tell Samuel, then get up. Yeah. Quit crying. People have not rejected you. They're rejecting me. I warned them about getting a king. I warned them what was going to happen. But you know that I, my people is a stiff-necked people. Yeah. Up to that point, God had been ruling the nation. God had been raising up leaders as they were needed. That's how things had been operating from the time of Moses down to the time of the judges. They've been warned over and over again about the dangers of elevating a man to the throne. It would bring about political corruption and it would bring about great trouble so that when Saul was finally chosen to be king, the people were absolutely elated. They were elated because Saul was a fine specimen of a man. He stood, you remember what the Bible says, head and shoulders above everybody in Israel. He looked like a king. Now whereas Saul may have been a giant among men, he was a spiritual pig. Yeah. Saul was a jealous man. Saul was a disturbed man. He lived for the praises of the people. He tended to overstep his boundaries and was guilty of gross disobedience to the commands of the Lord God Almighty. Remember how that God had said to Israel that I'm going to remember what the Amalekites did to you when you brought, were brought up out of Egyptian bondage and you were a feeble people and you were mm. on your way to the promised land and you asked yeah. the Amalekites to just give you some bread and give you some raisins and give you some figs and give you some dates and just let you eat as you were going through but the Amalekites refused to help you. God said, I ain't going to forget this. Mm. Some 300 years, 400 years had passed by. And when Saul had been raised up to be king, God said, I remember what Amalek did. Yeah. I remember how they didn't help. Now rise up. Take your army. Go down and utterly destroy the Amalekites. Amen. Mm. From the king on the throne to the peasant in the field. Kill everything and everybody. Don't spare a thing. Mm. Saul heard that. Went down there. Spared Agag the king. Spared the best of the sheep. Spared the best of the oxen. Am I right about it? Right. Did all of that. Came back. When Samuel came in. Saul saw him. Agag is sitting there. Samuel walks in. Saul said, Blessed be the Lord. I've kept the commandments of the Lord. And Samuel said, in effect, well, you must not know about me. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Amen. If, if, if that's the case, if you kept the commandments of the Lord, what's the lowering of the oxen and the bleeding of the sheep that I hear? What's Agad doing sitting up there beside you? If you've done what God said, you must be doing. Saul said, well, you know who the people are. I, I spared Agad the king, yes, and I spared uh, the oxen and, and the sheep because I, I wanted to make a, a sacrifice to the Lord. Say, and that's why other folk will tell you in a heartbeat. Well, see, I'm cleaning that house so that I can. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little bit more to give, give to God. Yeah, that, that's why I'm doing that. Yeah. Samuel had to say, have the Lord a delight in sacrifices and offerings? Behold, rebellion and stubbornness 
It says the sin of witchcraft. Because you have rejected God's word, God has rejected you. God has rejected you from being king. Samuel turned to walk away. Saul doesn't want to let go. He doesn't want to let go of the kingdom. He reaches out, grab hold of Samuel's garment. Samuel is still walking away. Saul is still pulling. While Saul is pulling, Samuel is still walking. As he walks, his garment rips. Yes. No, you, 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 you can't do too much to a preacher without him finding a lesson in it. Yes. <laughs> so Samuel turned around and got a lesson from that. He looked back and said, but as you rip my garment this day, as you tore my garment, God has ripped the kingdom from you. God has told you, you must not know about me. God can take all to God and effect says to Saul, you got me twisted. You must not know about me. I can have another king in a minute. Matter of fact, he'll be here in a minute. Right. To the left, to the left, everything you own in a box. To the left, you must not know about me. I can have another you by tomorrow. Don't you ever get to think? Yes. You're irreplaceable. Help me something. Mm -hmm. When God chose David, he was choosing an unlikely candidate for such a lofty and a powerful office. In God's choice of David as king, we're allowed to see something of the process that God uses when he chooses. Yes. There is a process that God uses when he chooses. God's choices are sovereign choices. He made a sovereign choice. See, it's against the backdrop of rebellion. It's against the backdrop of rejection and disobedience that God begins the process of choosing a new king to reign over Israel. He's ready to raise up a new king. He's ready, in fact, to raise up a new king when he puts the first king in there. Mm. He puts the first king in there just so that he can demonstrate what kind of king they really need. God had made a choice. God was working behind the scenes during those difficult days in Israel's history to pave the way to fulfill his divine promise. Yes, his choices are sovereign in their planning. See, Samuel is told where to go to find the new king, and it appears that the Lord has been arranging everything to bring this new king into the world at precisely the right moment in history. Right. If you look back at the ancestry of King David, you'll find the hand of God moving and shaping the events and circumstances of his life even before he got here. One of David's ancestors was a woman by the name of Rahab. You remember Rahab in Judges chapter 2? She'd been saved out of pagan idolatry, brought into the nation of Israel. She married a man by the name of Salmon. Salmon, according to Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 5, they became the parents of a man named Boaz in Ruth chapter 4 that verse number 20 Ruth was a woman taken out of paganism Ruth was a Moabite I'm going to talk more about that during the course of the week Boaz married this Gentile girl this Moabite by the name of Ruth Ruth and Boaz had a son by the name of Obed Obed had a son by the name of Jesse Jesse had a boy by the name of David. See, these events were not accidental. God is saying in circumstance, you must not know about me. You, you don't know how I can work a plan. You don't know how I can formulate something in eternity past and work it out in your present. These things were not a coincidence. It's the mighty hand of God. Yeah. God's choices are sovereign in their power. Not just in their planning and in their preparation, but they're sovereign in their power. Did you see in our text that Brother Stanley read? Did you see in verse uh, uh, verse number one, we notice the words in the text, I have, I have, in that verse it says, I have rejected him, and I have provided me. How long are you going to mourn for Saul? I have rejected him, I have uh, provided me. Many people have great plans. They got big dreams. But they don't have the power to bring it to pass. Right. Not so with the Lord. The Lord says, I have. And when the Lord proposes, he can dispose. Now, what lessons can we learn from the sovereign choice of God? I think that there are several here. First, 
that there are no accidents in life. Not one. Everything, everything in life, yes, even your life, is part of a larger plan. God is working, oftentimes behind the scenes, in ways that sometimes we cannot comprehend to accomplish his plan, accomplish his purposes. We believe and maintain Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28. I know it's the most difficult passage in all the Bible to believe. I know we struggle with Romans 8 and verse number 28. I know that the child of God wrangles with that passage, but the Bible says we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, those that are called according to his purpose. Paul didn't say we guess. He didn't say we hope. He didn't say we speculate. He didn't say we, we, we try. He said we know. Yes. We know that this thing is going to work out together for good. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. My thoughts I'm not your thoughts. My ways I'm not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth. So are my ways and my thoughts above your. Do you know what your Bible says? Psalms 37 and verse number 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Don't you realize that when you strive to be good before God, do that which is right by it, and there's only one way to do good and be good, and that's to be in Christ Jesus. Amen. So when the Bible says the steps of a good man, a good man is going to only be defined by a Christian man. A Christian man, thank God for the truth that God is in absolute control of our lives. God is well able to bring his plans to pass. He will never propose a plan that he's not able to accomplish. We're talking about the sovereign will of God. Whether it's a plan to raise up a little shepherd boy and make him king. Whether it's a plan to raise you up and work, yes, even in your life, God is able to see it through. The fact is, you got to trust him. Don't you dare say, God, sure, you must not know about me. I can raise you up well past your current situation. It don't matter what's going on with you. If you can learn to trust God. Somebody said, well, Brother Preacher, I don't think I'm ever going to really amount to nothing. I, 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 I can't uh, learn. I'm not learning fast enough. I can't retain these things. Don't you realize that the only thing that is designed to defeat you is you. Amen. You tell yourself you can't do it, but then you, you've already defeated yourself. But see, the child of God, the child of God maintains, I can through Christ. I can through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I can't remember nothing, Brother Preacher. You, you remember what you want to remember. Now, I'm not talking about if we've got a disease. I'm not talking about if there's some kind of chemical imbalance. I'm not talking about that attribute. It's because a lot of people would defeat themselves beyond just physical limitations. And even with physical limitations, there are things that are designed to help you even get past that. You've got to learn how to trust in the Lord God Almighty. Mm -hmm. You have to learn to put your faith and your reliance upon Him and have that confidence in the abilities and strengths that God has given to you. And God has dealt out to every man a measure of faith. Talking from primarily right now to the child of God, I don't presume to understand it all. But I believe the Bible teaches that God is in the business of working things out. Yes. Working them out in accordance to his will and bringing his eternal purposes to pass in time. Do you remember your Bible? Isaiah 46 verses 9 and 10. There the Bible says, remember the former things of old. For I am the Lord and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I shall do all my pleasure. It's only God that's able to declare the end from the beginning. We can't see it like God. We don't understand it like God. But here's what we can do. We can trust God. We can trust the fact that God knows what he's doing, and all I got to do is put my hand in his hand, and everything is going to be all right. Some right. folk are bothered by the notion that God is in absolute control of life. I, however, find it comforting, knowing that nothing can happen to me 
unless the Father ordains it. And if the Father ordains it, then it's for my good and yeah. to his glory. Amen. Yes, even if I perceive it as difficult, even if I perceive it as hard, even if I perceive it as something that if I'd have had a choice, I wouldn't have did it that way. If I would have had a say so, I wouldn't have gone that particular route. But I trust yeah. God, you see. And because I trust God, I know that everything is going to be all right. You must not know about me. That, that's what God said. You, you must not know about me. You must not know how I can do stuff. You must not know how I can work things out. God's choices, they're also surprising. See, this text is a mind blow. It's a, it, it, it blew Samuel's mind. It sure enough blew soul mind. That's why he couldn't tell me. I wouldn't tell it. Samuel is set off to Bethlehem to anoint a new king. And when he arrives there, he commands Jesse, I love this part, to gather together all his sons. They come before the old prophet and pass before him one by one. And it's in that process that God makes known his choice to be king. But he chooses his choices while they're sovereign. They also carry with it some big surprises. It's surprising in what God will reject. How do you know when you're hearing truth? Mm. It's surprising what God will do. It really is. Would, would you be surprised to know this morning that uh, one faith is not as good as another faith? Would you be surprised to realize this morning that one approach to God may not be fit? That there is an avenue whereby we must approach God whereby we must then serve God, whereby we must honor God. See, God's choices are surprising in what it is that God himself will reject. The first of Jesse's sons passed before Samuel. His name is Iliad. The name means God is Father. He is a fine specimen of a man. And Samuel, when he sees him, thinks that he's the show, chosen one. Samuel sees him and says, Sure, the Lord's anointed is before me. But God says, You must not know about me. I have refused him. The word refused simply means I've rejected him. Now, Iliad may have looked pleasing outwardly, but something in his character disqualified him from being king. Uh-huh. Abinadab is next. His name means my father is noble, but he too is passed over and rejected by the Lord. Shammah is next. His name means astonishment. It, 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 it might refer to his size. It, it might refer to his stature. It might refer to his physical appearance, but he too is passed over. Yeah. One after another of Jesse's sons passed before Samuel. And Samuel is told by God. And Samuel conveys to Jesse, neither has God chosen these. Amen. Do you not know that denominationalism is passed over by God? See, it may outwardly seem right. It may appear right. But see, God does not judge by the appearance. No, no. Amen. Amen. God says, I have refused this. God says, I have rejected this. Why? It's a matter of heart. It's a matter of doctrine. It's a matter of, see, what makes the church of Christ the right church? Yeah. What, what makes it the Bible church? as opposed to denominationalism. And what makes denominationalism wrong? They're good people. Yes. Honest people, mm -hmm. upright people, fair-minded people. Mm -hmm. what, what, what makes them wrong? What, what is it that fixed Iliad that he could not reign as king? See, now we're talking about a matter of the heart. A matter of heart. What's at the core of this thing? What's wrong with denominationalism? 
What's wrong with Baptist and Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopalian? What's wrong with Catholicism? We're talking about the heart. Mm -hmm. What's at the heart of it? Now, at the heart of it is a doctrine and a philosophy, a teaching that cannot be substantiated. It can't be backed up with the saith the Lord. All during the balance of this week, the Lord give us strength to get down to Wednesday. We're going to do what Jesus did. Yeah. Jesus went to the synagogue, opened the book, and found the place yeah. where it is written. Amen. That's the problem in our denomination of things. Their doctrine, their teaching. They're not able to open the book and find the place where it's written. That's right. As a result thereof, it becomes a problem with the heart. Yeah. What's at the core? What's at the essence of that thing? Now, Baptist people are good people. Lutheran people are good people. Muslims, good people. Amen, somebody. Right. Catholics, good people. The problem is a problem of the heart. Mm. Let's open the book. And find the place where it's written. Right. See, if I can open up the book and find the place that one church is just as good as another, then we'd be all right. right. It wouldn't matter. But see, I can't open up the book and find that because it's not there. I can't open up the book and find a Baptist in the Bible. Right. It's not there. I can't open up the book and find a Lutheran in the Bible. It's not there. Somebody said, Freeman, you should be calling folk names. I'm calling you name. I'm calling what you call yourself. Amen. I'm calling you what you call yourself. I'm just asking you, open the book. And let's find the place. Mm -hmm. Where it is let, let, Let's find it. If we can, then we don't have a problem. See, if you can open up the book and find a place where I can have communion once a month, then we're fine. And we can just keep on doing it just like that. The problem is, I can't open the book and find it. Right. Because it's not there. Right. So if I'm holding on to that as doctrine, then it's a problem of the heart. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Yes, was standing there. He looked like a king. He had the appearance of a king. Samuel saw him and said, surely, I ain't got to look no further. The Lord's anointed is before me. And God said, you must not know about me. Right. Don't look at his heart. Don't look at Shammah. Don't, don't look at his stature. Don't look at Shammah's stature. Don't look at Abinadab's stature. Any one of these men were fine specimens. Any one of them would have had the physical requirements to turn heads and rule as king. And when we look at our Baptist friend and our Lutheran friend and our Jehovah Witness friend, they have zeal and determination and a desire to serve God. Our Baptist friends will be in church all day. Yes. All day. Won't get mad. Pass that basket six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Yes. Amen, somebody. And every time it pass back, they're going to put something in there. Yes. If it's changed, it's the folded kind. Or the written kind. <laughs> put something in there. We're not talking about this. There's evil. I bear them. They have a zeal for God. I must be free. They'll be out there in the rain and the snow and the sleet and the hail. I can be mm -hmm. proud like some information. I'm going to give you some information. You don't have to argue with none of them. Well, I got to wear that bow tie. You ask, sometimes you ask a brother to put a tie and a jacket on, he looks at you like, you must not know about me. They'll fuss you down. I must be free if they don't do that. They put the little bow ties on. Amen. Amen. Our Jehovah Witness friends, every Saturday, go out there knocking the door. We'll tell you the heartbeat in a minute. We'll tell you in a minute. Dark knocking door, that, that, that's crazy. Ain't nobody going to pay no attention to that. Now, our, our denominational friends are still doing it. Amen, somebody. Amen. Oh, see, God has said in that effect, you're judging it based on the wrong criteria. You're judging these men on the wrong criteria. You're look, looking at them through human eyes. And I know that we're the same way. Here's a young man, he's handsome, well-spoken, well, he's intelligent. We look at him and say, man, he'll make a fine preacher. That'd be a fine preacher someday, so the problem is we can't see his heart. 
we can't see his heart. We see a young man, he's saved, good to his family, got some good businesses, he's savvy out there in the business world, but again, we say, oh, he make a good elder. He make a good deacon. The problem is, we can't see his heart. Amen. We don't know what's in his heart. We judge people how they strike the eye. God sees them on a different level. We yeah. judge things, our churches and congregations, based upon the eye. God is looking at a different matter. Yeah. He's talking about the doctrine now, the teaching now. That person we think who would do great things in the church may not even be a blip on the radar screen of God's great wisdom. By that one, we think may mock to nothing. We think may not be able to accomplish anything. Might well be used mightily in the hand of God. You see, God makes his choice based on not what he sees on the outward characteristics, but rather the content of our heart. God said, you must not know about me. The way I deal with things is Choices are surprising in their requirements. See, before Saul was ever ceased to be king, God had already determined to raise up another man who was after his own heart. You see, some folk are fired and they don't even know they're fired. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Yeah. And that's a lesson that we can learn today in the church. We look for leaders. We often look for those who possess certain characteristics that we think will spare success and ability. We look for people of power, look for people of influence, look for people of intelligence, look for people of means. God, however, looks for people of integrity, of character. God wants individuals who are faithful, who are holy, who are determined, who are consecrated. God realizes you can't give a man work to make him faithful. You give a faithful man work because he is faithful. Right. Amen. What a contrast. God is not nearly as impressed with people's characteristics as we are. He's not concerned about the beauty of the outward man. He's yeah. not caught up in those things. He's wrapped up in the condition of the heart. So hey. if God looks at you this morning, as God looks at your life, what does he see? Does he see a handsome face? Yeah. Does he see a physical pleasing specimen? Does he see someone well groomed and well kept and good looking? No. no. He sees your heart. Yeah. He sees the real you. So here's the real question. When God sees your heart, does he see a heart that he can use? Or does he look at your life? Does he look at your life and say the same thing he said about Iliad? I have refused him. I have refused him. God looks at our Baptist friends. He looks at our Methodist friends. He looks at our Episcopalian friends. He looks at our Muslim friends. And he says, I have refused him. I've refused him. Or he may have got it going on on the outside, but there's a problem with his heart. Yeah. The problem with his heart is the doctrine that he subjected himself to. Paul was preaching his heart out, went down there to the city of Ephesus. The Bible says in Acts chapter 19, he found certain disciples down there. Yeah. Found these disciples. These were learners. These were followers. Paul says to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They looked at him and said, we ain't even heard of the Holy Ghost. You're talking about the Holy Ghost. Paul was unto what then? Have you been baptized? What have you subjected yourself to? You ain't never heard of the Holy Ghost. You talk to some people today. They're religious. They're praying. God they're striving to be God. I sit down with people in restaurants and I see somebody over there praying. And I always make a comment. Always, whenever I see that, I, I tell them, I stop there. That's good to see somebody praying to God. Amen. Behind their food. Where, where do you happen to go to church? And they tell me something about some do I did it bill somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I try right then to bring them to a greater understanding Amen. about what God said. Because see, it's, it's a hurtful thing to see somebody striving to be religious. <laughs> but in heaven. Yes. Amen. 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 Pray. God in here. God look at me. I can keep you. Yeah. I'm telling you something, I'm going to prove that to you by the word of God. Uh, Ellis, bring, bring me that chart up here in a little bit. I'm going to wrap this thing up, and I need that, I need that chart. God looked at Iliad, and he said, I refused him. God looks at denominationalism and says the same thing. He says, I refuse him. God's choice is surprising in its reception. Yes, it is. It's, it's surprising in what it is that God would receive. See, now, after the seven sons of Jesse had passed before him, before Samuel, 
and every last one of them has been rejected, Samuel finds out that there's another son. He's the youngest. He said to be out there with the sheep. Friends, think about it. He is so insignificant within the family that he's not even summoned with the rest of the boys. He's left out there outside the feast, left outside the sacrifice. He's out there doing the humble job. He's out there doing the work of a servant. He's out there with them stinking, nasty, bleating sheep. In fact, he's not even mentioned by the father by name. He's not even called by name. When Samuel said, are these all your boys? Are these all your sons? And Jesse says, yeah, no. No, no, no. I got another one. And now he, he's the youngest. He, he's the young. God said, you must not know about me. Right. Go get him. Don't, don't, I, we not going to even sit down until you bring him in. Sometimes we look at the church and it seems to be so insignificant. It seems to be the fact that we ain't got next to nothing. We're either in a storefront or in a hotel. Or we, our pillows are old and dilapidated. They beat down. We pass by our denominational friends and they got parking lots and folk in there by the thousands. All right. The individual standing there ain't preaching nothing. All right. <laughs> they preaching nothing. Amen, somebody. Yeah. And then we find our way down to the
Sometimes it's still. We open up our mouth and boom, we're pulling on the Yes. It's all the loud, man. We gotta be trying to explain that. We talked about it this morning this morning. The good that I would do, I don't do. The evil that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who's gonna deliver me from the body of this death? Yes. I'm going to graphically explain even that passage of scripture before this week is out. I'm telling you this morning, only God would have made choices of the choices that he did. God is specific in his choice. It seems crystal clear that God had specific plans in man. Crystal clear. Can't you see that now? He sent Samuel to a specific town, to a specific family in that town, took him to a specific person. Chosen to be the next king, very briefly, there are some indications of why God did make the choice of David as opposed to anybody else. See, when Je I, I love this part, verse number five of the text that Brother Stanley read. When Jesse and David's brothers are brought in before Samuel, the Bible says they're sanctified. Is that right? They were sanctified for the feast. In other words, their sins had to be dealt with. And then they were made ready for worship. Mm -hmm. Then they were made ready for the consecration. But when David is brought in, there ain't no time for him to be sanctified. Mm -hmm. no but he's ready nonetheless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you must not know about me. Yeah. See, that even yeah. David can say that. See, David is a picture of that believer who keeps his heart ready. Keeps himself in a state of readiness. He doesn't know when God might show up. He doesn't know when God might call upon him to utilize him. That's the kind of person that God is looking for today. He's looking for that individual who's also looking for him. God cannot use dirty vessels. He can only use those vessels that are clean and ready. I'm talking to those in the church now. Amen. You want God to use you? And there's nothing wrong with being great in the kingdom of God. Right. You see, be great. You got to be willing to serve. Amen. And that's why many of us will never rise to greatness. Because we don't want to serve nobody. When God called David, he finds him faithfully doing what he was been told to do. Keeping the sheep. Mm -hmm. He's doing a dirty job. A lonely job. An isolated job. But he's doing it because that's the job he's been assigned to do. And after Amen. he's anointed, even after he's anointed, even after the oil is poured upon him, and the Bible graphically says, the, from that day forth, the Spirit of God came upon him. Mm -hmm. The Bible says he went right back out there taking care of them sheep. Amen. Amen. He didn't walk around the rest of that day until them brothers said, Yay, now. <laughs> Did y'all check out just what happened? <laughs> I bet you won't be messing with me no more, baby. I bet you, you'll call me by my name now, won't you? Now, he didn't have that attitude. See, some folks, Stanley, you can't give them no kind of power. Some folks, you can't, you can't put them in charge of directing folks to the seats. <laughs> just with that little job, just with that little power, what, what's in the heart will come on out. I told you to sit here, not there, but you sit there. <laughs> David had the holy oil poured on Had been anointed by God's prophet to be the next king. When the next time we see David? Right back out there doing what he had been doing before. Being a servant. Humble, That's what God is looking for. God is looking for humility within our heart. See, even after he's called to Jerusalem to play for King Saul, he returned to the father's sheep. And we're right about it. He does that because that's what he's been assigned to do. He had been given that assignment and he carried it out faithfully. Even when he placed his life on the land to protect those sheep, he did it when God was working with this man. I know, in, in just reading the text, what well, we can speculate from that, what well, we can surmise from that. When Jesse looked at David, he saw the youngest of his sons. When his brothers looked at him, they saw a little brat. When Samuel looked at him, he saw a cute little boy. But when God saw him, yes. Yes. I said, you, you must not know about me. Yes. He saw a man of integrity. He saw a man of faithfulness. He saw a man of responsibility. He saw a man of character. Others saw a nobody. God saw a king. I'm telling you this morning, that's what God sees when he sees you. That's what he sees when he sees you. If you want to be used by the Lord, let, let me encourage you this right here. Be faithful right where you are. You're a child of God already. You're a Christian. 
be faithful right where you are. The best thing you can do is grow where you've been planted. And allow God to develop your character. Allow you to develop your integrity, your faithfulness, your sense of responsibility, your congregation, your, your, and, and consecration in the ordinary, simple, mundane events of life. Let just God keep working with you right where you are. Be reliable. Be responsible. Be ready. You don't know when the Lord's going to open up the door. You don't know when the Lord's going to call upon you to rise up and serve in a public venue. I know that, when, that, that may have been the first time that David comes on the public scene. That may be the first time that he's jumped up and elevated to the public spectacle and public sight, but he had been working with God a long time. Yes. God, he knows where you are. He knows how to find you. He knows how to open up the doors at the right time in your life to keep you right where he wants you to be. So you be faithful in your walk to him right now. And in his time, he's going to utilize you to his glory. Now, I'm going to tell you something this morning. God's still looking for people. He's still looking for people. That he can use. Now, can you honestly say that your life is ready? Can you honestly say your life is available? Do you really possess the kind of character that God is looking for right now? See, if you know you got a problem in your walk, if you know that and you're aware of that, I'm inviting you right now. I'm inviting you right now to get that thing corrected. I, I, I invite you to confess your sins. I invite you to confess Christ. I invite you to put him on in baptism, to become a member of the church of Christ. That's mm -hmm. the church that Jesus Christ is married to. It's the one Jesus Christ died for. It's the one that indeed is his bride. He is the one that he is the king over. He is the head of. And friends, this morning and every morning, the Lord Jesus Christ only has one bride. To suggest that Jesus has more than one bride is to suggest he's committing spiritual adultery. And I'm not going to let you say that to Jesus without a fight on your head. Because the Bible testifies to the fact that Christ is married to the church. Amen. And he only yes. has one. Right. He only has one. You need to become a member of that. See, if you desire to be utilized by the Lord, I invite you to come to him. I invite you to renew your commitment to him and your consecrated endeavor to the Lord Jesus Christ Almighty. See, his needs can become your needs. And your desire. God, see, God is able to fix all things under the counsel of his own good word. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wonder this morning if you're ready. See, if you're ready to deal with God, then God is ready to deal with you. Yes. If you're ready to commit your life to him, he's ready to commit himself to you because he's already done it through the sending of his son. Yes. The son sacrificed his life. Am I right about it? Yes. To make it possible that you and I can have a right to the tree of life. First John chapter 5 and verse number 7. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 7. I, I, I'm wondering this morning, are you ready? Yes. Are you ready for those three that bear a record yes. in heaven? Yes, Amen, somebody. Amen. Yes. There are three that bear a record in heaven. And that three that bear a record in heaven, they are one. Yes. Amen. They're one. The three that are one. Not three in one, but three that are one. And the Bible talks about the three that are one. It says that we're dealing with the Father the Word, and the, and the Holy Ghost. Am I right about it? Yeah. And the Bible says these three are one. Right. Then the Bible says in that very next verse, if you're ready, it talks about the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Am I right about it? Yeah. See, if you're ready for the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. And then the Bible says the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Yeah. Now, if you're ready for that, then you're ready for the facts of the gospel. That's the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Am I right about it? Right. See, Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. Right. And that's the facts of the gospel. That's right. it, it fixes it so that we can understand the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. In conjunction with the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Uh -huh. Giving us the understanding about the death, burial, and the resurrection. Man. See, when we're there, I, I, I'm asking now, are you ready? See, if you're ready, then you can understand what he means by in 1 Corinthians 13. When he talks about those three that are the abiding three. Am I right about it? Mm -hmm. Faith, hope, and charity. Am I right about it? That, that, that this abiding three, not by faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest.
prince of these is Jared. That, that's if you're ready. See, and if you're ready, then, then we're ready for the one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And then when we're really ready, we can hear, believe, <laughs> repent, <laughs> confess, <laughs> and be baptized. And the Lord then will add us to the church. Now see, you'll only get it if you're ready. If you can't see it yet, God says you, you must not know about me. You must not know and realize what, how God can take the circumstances of your life. The circumstances of your life and bring you right to that relationship. Right where God would have you to be. Now maybe you're here this morning. And you're outside the opposite. You're outside of God's kingdom. Outside of that grace. Outside of the very family of God. The very fabric of God. God can find you right where you are. And bring you to that truth. We're under that banner of things. But according to the sweet, how do you know the truth? How are you going to know it? I got a word for you this morning. We'll know it because we're going to keep looking back to the book. We're going to keep asking ourselves over and over again, where is it in the book? Let me open the book and find the place where it's written. And let God lead me to the very scheme of redemption. Maybe you're here this morning. You can find yourself in subjection to the earnest pleadings of God by way of the Spirit of God. God is ready to anoint you. God is ready to make you a king and a priest. God is ready to sanctify you. He's ready to consecrate you. He's ready to redeem you. He's ready to reconcile you back to himself. He sent the Son to die in your stead, to die on your behalf, to make good on that promise upon this rock I build my church. Friends, there's only one, according to Matthew 16 and verse 18. And yeah. if you're ever going to see God's face in peace, you got to hear the gospel. you got to believe the same. You must repent of your sins. You must confess faith in Christ and be baptized in water. You're yeah. right here right now. Right now. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand.